I read a very uh, interesting article regarding uh, happiness. And what was fascinating about it, that the article uh, brought up that young people tend to be less happy than older people. Huh? Good one, huh? You read that? Ah, oh, okay, 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 okay. So if you if you would see that most people that you that you meet or you ask them, are you happy? Very few people will tell you they're really happy. And I'm okay. Hey, you know, one of the things I really I don't say bother me, but you know, everybody's saying, oh, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem became like such a. It's like today people say Baruch Hashem, like whatever. You know, how are you doing? I don't know, whatever. You know, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem is, is a totally different uh, mindset than, than what people say. However, uh, there will be very few people that would testify upon themselves, that would say, you know what, I, I'm a happy, happy person, because it's quite surprising. Why? Because you have all the opportunities to reach happiness, and for whatever reason, we don't. If you have any reason to be happy, or reasons to be cheerful, like Ian Dury said, there's a song like this, reasons to be cheerful, part two. So, for whatever reason is, is, you're never happy. You have every possibility. Everything is in your disposal to be happy. And for whatever reason, you're not happy. Um, you know, if you look at this, we leave. You know, if you, if you would fly, I don't know, 10, 12 hours away from where you are. It doesn't make a difference if you're in Europe or in the United States. You're going to come to see things in the world <clears throat> that are that, that might shock you. I mean, if you fly ten hours and you end up in in Africa or or in Central America or you know in Europe, you fly to areas in China and, and Kazakhstan and like you know places like this in the world, where life is completely different than what you got used to. I mean, they're they're understanding of things is quite different. They look at the world different than us. And it would shock you because you might go to a place like I don't know, somewhere in the in the in the prairies of Mongolia, you know, or and it's so quiet and people have life and they have no idea mm -hmm. what the hustle and bustle that our life are going, you know, what we are going through. It's a totally different world. Their values is completely different. And that's why I'm a very big advocate of going out and seeing places. And I'll tell you why in a second. But ultimately, it's good for you if you, of course, apply the right thing and you see really how lucky you are, or maybe unlucky you are. But life is completely different. We have so much. Imagine you will have to go, uh, you, want a, you want a glass of milk. And you can't have it unless you have a cow or a goat in your backyard. There's no such thing as just like opening the refrigerator and taking a glass of milk. Or... You feel like eating a steak today, and hmm, what should I have? Should I have veal, beef, or should I have lamb? And if so, which cut should I have? No, let me see open the freezer and see what I have, right? I'll just go two seconds to the supermarket and pick something up. I mean, because that's how, that's where you grow steaks. You grow them on supermarket shelves. And you don't really understand how convenient it is for you because it's not like that in many parts of this world. You want to have a cow? You want to have a steak? It's not a problem. <laughs> you can have a whole cow because that's exactly what you're having. You're cutting your cow. I don't know. I don't know if that's what you really want to do. So guess what? I'm not having steak. Or you want clothes? It's not a problem. You go to the to the Gap, to the Old Navy, to Nordstrom, to Versace, whatever you want. There is, you know, it's just got some stuff. And for whatever reason, somehow we are very. Very unhappy. I mean, we have everything. We have everything. Uh, we have a choice, for example, to most part, who we're going to marry. It wasn't like in the old days. It says, okay, you marry her, her marry him. There's no such thing, him marry him, her marry her, it marry it. You know, there's no such thing like this. You know, I've never heard of it. Maybe that's one way to deal with things. However, you have a choice who to marry. Um, 
You have a choice what you're going to go to school for. You want to learn archaeology? No, go learn archaeology. You want to learn uh, nuclear science? Go ahead. Go, whatever you want. You want to learn philosophy? You want to learn engineering? The whole spectrum. Whatever you want, you could decide. You're lucky. I mean, you don't understand how lucky you are because some people don't have the choice of what, not only of what should I go to learn, they don't have a choice of going to learn, period. In places like, I don't know, Burma or Vietnam or places like this, a kid reached seven years old, he doesn't want to go to school, say, go to school, go become a fisherman. That's it, that's it. Until the end of the time, he's going to be a fisherman. No questions asked. Oh, excuse me, we can't afford you to go anymore to school. You got to go to work because, you know, the family depends on you. And where are we going to teach you? I cannot teach you when, you, when you're going to be 20 years old because I'm going to be 70 years old. I can't do that. I'm going to learn when you're 40. And, you know, you get the idea. We're we lucky. You, you can choose which, what kind of a job you want to work, not only to learn what kind of job you want to do. You want to work from home. You don't want to work from home. Where are you going to settle down in the world? You know, you want to you wanna move to, uh, to New Zealand? Go ahead, move you to New Zealand. You want to move uh, to Alaska? Go ahead. Nobody's stopping you. Do whatever you want. Medicine had progressed a lot and therefore increases our chances to, to, uh, to become healthier, those who are sick. Uh, people who cannot have kids, they could have kids. Technology allows us to receive everything we want. ASAP, as they say, I needed it yesterday. In the olden days, you want to make a pot, it's not a problem. You have to go to the, to the pot maker, and you sit down, and he makes it out of clay, and then he has to let it dry for two weeks, and then he puts it in a kiln, and you know, you can't just go, excuse me, uh, can I have it uh, the next day, I want it, you know. There's no such thing. And yet, and yet that all the conditions, we, it seems like we have all the conditions to cause us that uh, desired happiness, and for whatever reason, we see that many researchers have shown that from the age of 20, the level of happiness, and I'm sure you can all relate to it, you, you, it's on a decline. You are less happy 25 than you are 20. At 20, you are at your peak. Happiest. And... And around the age of like, uh, let's say, 45 or so on and so forth, right? Reaches its 40, 45, reach its peak. That's reach, not peak, reach rock bottom. And then it starts to go up again around 50. And you should know that this, uh, that uh, we said that we are not happy or we lost happiness is not dependent on, a, on the fact whether you're married or you're not married, whether you have kids or you don't have kids, your level of income, etc., 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 etc. It just say, are you happy or you're not happy? And naturally, I mean, because we're all obsessed with this seek of happiness, you know. Um, happiness got a tremendous, tremendous attention in terms of, of researchers and, and our seek or willingness to look for it. Uh, you know, and regardless of, the, of that, uh, you know, the, the, the search research has shown that the objective life circumstances does not, does not determine your subjective satisfaction on your level of happiness. And the question is why? Right, Michael, you're writing it down. Yeah. I know, write, write down in your computer. You do your work, I mean. So first of all, we call it the paradox of free choice. Paradox of free choice. Uh, there's an American psychologist, his name is Barry Schwartz, sounds like a Jew, that says that uh, having the ability to choose between a great variety of choices always creates a frustration. 
So let's say, for example, let's say I'm, I want to pick up, I want to have a car. I, wanna, I need a new car. I want to buy a car. Or let's say whatever. Let's say I need, not that I want. I need a new car. Hmm, so what should I get? Oh, maybe I'll get a pickup truck. Nice pickup truck. I love pickup trucks. It's good. A nice four by four, double cab, V8 engine, minimum V6. You know. 4.6, 5.8 liter engine, the king of the road. There's a song like that too, king of the road. Anyway, would the car would do it without a doubt, close to 200,000 miles on it. Change the oil, change the brakes, the car will go. But then again, uh, if I'm going to pick up that particular car, be, with all with all the reasoning why I'm giving up advantages that other cars would have. For example, there are advantages to other cars. Let's say I'll take a Honda Accord or a Subaru. Right? Well, they're light, they're nimble, they're good on gas, they're easy to find parking, you know, and so on and so forth. So when I'm choosing something, I'm giving up on the advantages of something else. Even I'll take the difference between, between a Samsung and, uh, and an iPhone, right? If I pick up an iPhone over, over Samsung, right? So Samsung has this advantage. I don't really know what it is. I got an old phone, which is fine. I have, uh, so Samsung has its own advantages versus Apple that has its own advantages. So if I picked up one over the other, it means that I consciously gave up on the advantages of the other one. And, uh, and when I do that, right, all of a sudden it magnifies any, any uh, <clears throat> disadvantage that the item that I chose might have. And it would magnify it. For example, if I pick up a pickup truck and all of a sudden it does, I don't know, uh, 20 miles a gallon when my friend has, uh, I don't know, uh, a Honda Accord and it does 30 miles a gallon, or he can fight parking and I cannot fight parking, all the advantages in which I pick that pickup truck will come to be disappearing. And now all the disadvantages will be magnified right in front of me. And I say, oh my goodness, why did I have to pick up this pickup truck? It's a monster. I live here, the cities are tight, the streets are tight. What do I need this for? Needless to say, you know, you wanted a TRD with the, uh, with the super suspension and, 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 you know, so on and so forth. You forgot about it. Now it's a problem. Now it's a problem. And that creates a tremendous level of frustration uh, inside of us, right? And, and we come to regret we come to regret the choice that we made and because it's not a perfect choice and ultimately what happens since we regret it we blame ourselves. Why? Because who chose it? Who is the one who made that decision? You did. So therefore who are you blaming? Yourself. Now you see why Excuse me, so many people don't want to make a decision. They want somebody else to make a decision for them. Even if they act like generous, no, 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 you make the decision. You go to a restaurant, people are afraid to make a decision. No, no, you order, whatever you order, I'm fine with it. Why? If it's good, you know, it's good, okay. If it's bad, it's your fault. You don't want to make a decision. You're afraid. Because everything becomes like an accumulation of so-called bad decisions that you make. So that disappointment, that disappointment has an accumulative effect that in front of you there are endless amount of decisions that you make. For example, when you're going to bring kids, right? I should have kids before I'm settled down in my career or after I'm settled down in my career, right? Everything is a plus and a minus. Uh, which car should I buy? Which TV should I buy? Which cell phone should I buy? Which medical insurance should I take? You know, you go to the medical insurance, thanks to Big Brother Obama, you know? He has now uh, the Comrade, 
comrade uh, Obama gave us a choice of, of uh, health food, uh, health food, I mean, you know, that's another issue. You know, I spoke to my kids about the Michelle Obama menu. They hate it. They don't eat it. You know, he's in, he's in, he's in yeshiva, so now they get lunch from, so they have to have healthy food. They don't want that food. They want pizza. <laughs> they don't want whole wheat noodles. They want noodles. They don't, you know, whole wheat noodles. Yeah, kind of, whatever. Anyway. I mean, that's by the way, that's by the way a very bad things to do. And let me explain to you why. Because you didn't, choose, you didn't teach those kids to make the right decision. You prescribe them with that. So they're automatically going to reject that. There's no teaching process here. I am a superior being. I am the wife of the uh, El Duce, El Presidente. Therefore, I know more than you, and you're going to eat whatever I tell you to eat. The guy says, you know what, I'm not eating that. So when I get out of school, I'm going to drink. Not all. Okay, so, uh, so, so uh, Uncle uh, Bloomberg told us you can't buy 32 ounces soda? Good. Guess what? Until now, I didn't drink it. Guess what? Now I'm going to drink it. And I'm going to drink it 16 ounces at a time. You need to teach the people how to make decisions. But ultimately, don't blame them. Blame the people who don't want to make a decision. They want Big Brother to make a decision for them. They want government to make a decision for them. That what was good about this country, that it wasn't like this until now. That was the failure of Europe and Russia and all the other places, that there was an elite that decided for the rest of the peons, what should they do? That does not happen in Judaism when the Torah is open for all of you. In a way, Lehavdil, in a way. If you know anything about Confucianism in China, in a way it was like this. Let me explain to you what happened in China so you understand. Maybe, because if I'll tell you about Torah, you'll tell me, oh, come on, Rabbi, it's all about Torah. No, yeah, 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 we know, we know. So let me teach you about something else. Maybe you could reflect on it. On it. Before Confucius in this time, there were classes in China. You were a noble person or were you dirt? They came and they said, no. This is not going to be like this. You want to be a noble person? You know, Confucius said, among many other things that I said, he just repeated what I say. But one of the things he says, if you let the government run by politicians and generals, it's no good. Guess what? Most of the countries in the world, it's either by, by generals or by politicians. So let the scholars run the government. Let the scholars run the, the country. So then what happened? They said, okay, you want to pass, the, uh, you wanna pass the, the test? So fine. You pass the test, and then you're going to elevate. So that test was open to everybody. The first state tests were in China. You became a scholar. You pass the test, you move up a level. You pass the test, and everybody was equal. And it's wonderful. Now, in Lehavdil, in the world of Torah, it's like this. Torah is open to everybody. On the contrary, the Gemara says, Be careful, don't underestimate the children of poor people because Torah is going to come out of them. Because if you think that you are the son of the son of the son of, and because of that, you create yourself an elite. You're wrong. Because Torah is not going to come from you. Torah is going to come from the low ones. You're going to remember this. So, this is, this is, uh, this is the decisions that we make, you know, in terms of, in, in terms of, uh, in terms of that. You know, we have all this, uh, you know, all, all, all these this little decisions that, we struggle with, and nobody ever teaches you how to make decisions. Maybe instead of learning the, the theory of evolution, which is completely, you know, what, you know what evolution and Darwinism actually caused? You know what it caused? Yesterday was the 70 years of, of the release of Auschwitz by the Soviet troops. I'll tell you what Darwinism had caused in the world. It created the Holocaust. By creating a superior, the idea of a superior race, there were stems in Darwinism. They were more evolved, so therefore they could kill those cockroaches, the Jews and the gypsies, and so on and so forth. That's what. The, so instead of teaching you Darwinism, let them teach people how to make decisions. 
Do they have a class that they transition you and giving you the proper tools to transition, transition from like Cushing baby mama kind of a lifestyle to the world out there? All of a sudden you get a shell shot. And people take advantage. People take advantage of, of, of college graduates. They give them like, you know, because they don't know how to pick the right job. Because they don't know how to pick the right job and they feel therefore so bad for men take advantage of women and it's just horrendous, it's disgusting. They don't teach you how to make decisions. And that's why you fail. You're afraid. Because you keep on looking at it all the time. You don't know what kind of, I don't know, should, should I answer this uh, email? Should I not answer this email? What kind of a clothes should I buy? You know, so, you know, and so on and so on. Everything is a problem. So they solve the problem. They created fashion for you. This year is this fashion. This year we're wearing skinny jeans. Next year we, we're wearing uh, you know, low-cut jeans. Next year we're wearing bell-bottom jeans. And you don't have to worry. You're like, a, you're like an idiot. Whatever they tell you, you do. Don't have to worry. That's the style. Guess what? Start making your own style. You wear whatever you want. Everybody wearing skinny Why? I mean, why would any man in the world wear skinny jeans? That's beyond me. But never mind, you know. I guess they forgot to be men. Don't wear skinny jeans. Don't wear skinny clothes. It restricts the flow of energy. It restricts the flow of chi in the body. If I tell you that, you tell me, okay. Okay, not a problem. New age, you'll go fine. So you allow yourself. You want to be in. I told you, you will never be cool. Cool is a state of mind. Of course, when they made the word cool, they, they thought about me. But you understand what I'm saying to you? It's a state of mind. You don't need to wear, if you wear this kind of clothes, you don't become cool. Or that kind of clothes, you're not cool. You're cool because you are. Cool. When you are playing cool, you don't have a backbone. And when you don't have a backbone, people will take advantage of you. And ultimately, you're not going to feel happy. You're not going to be, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to be content with your life. Basically, you're wasting your life. What's the point of this life if you're not happy? So, this endless, endless opportunities that we have, together with that, elevate the level of expectations. Why? Since we have so many options, one of them has to be perfect for me. And when you compare between the choice that I made to my expectation, Michael, listen to that. I'll say it again. When I am comparing between the choice that I make to my expectation, there is, it becomes impossible not to disappoint, to be disappointed. And that's the problem. One of the biggest problems when we have in terms of marriage. You think that you deserve, I don't know, Sophia Loren. I don't know, whatever, you know. Elizabeth Taylor, at least. I don't know, you know, you know what I'm saying. I'm an old man, you know, that's uh, whatever. Meanwhile, you married a regular woman. Why is that you're looking for perfection? Well, first of all, you are not perfect. Well, first of all, you're never going to be perfect. It's, that's beautiful. So since I'm not going to be perfect, let's get out of it. Let's do, deal with the real things. I told you this before, I am fascinated with the concept of Japanese wabi-sabi. That simplicity, that they make things not perfect deliberately. When they have something and they make a little dent to make it imperfect, and they train themselves to find beauty with that simplicity, with that imperfection. Don't become OCD, because if you're real OCD, you'll be CDO, because they have to be in order. <laughs> you get the idea. And then, of course, we always hide behind syndromes. Everybody has a syndrome nowadays. Everything is a syndrome. You, you seek your individuality by your defects. Oh, I have a syndrome, so therefore I'm exempt from doing anything about it. I was born with it. 
I have a syndrome. No, what, what can I do? It's a syndrome. And so I'm saying, listen, I have a bad quality or a bad trait. No, I, need to, I, need to, I need to work on it. I need to work on it. You know, think about it. Everything today is a syndrome. Everything is a disorder. Everything is like this. You know? Just, it's just mind-boggling. So we have all these all these expectations, of course, uh, you know, and then of course you did become disappointed because you think you deserve perfect. I told you what my Rebbe used to say to me. So always before you go on a date, look at the mirror, take a look at a good look at yourself, and then go on a date. You know, in other words, have a reality check before you go out because it's a complete disconnect between what you think you are to what you really are. And therefore, the first one who wants to marry you, marry them. Because let me tell you, there's a lot of things that only you and HaKadosh Baruch Hu know. And if she's only willing to marry you, grab her. Of course, there's always a question, why would a girl who is normal would marry somebody like me? But you know, I mean, like you, of course, we have already a different story. But you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. Continue, okay, continue. So therefore, and then what happens? Since I've become so disappointed with all the things that I do, so now I'm just putting together all my disappointments from those hundreds and thousands of decisions that I make every single day. And the result is a complete discontent for myself. Why? Because when everything is possible, when everything is possible, when everything is allowed, when everything is at your disposal, I'm not elevating the level of happiness. I am reducing my satisfaction from what I have. Because the more I have, the less satisfied I have in what I have. The less satisfied I am in what I have. Eze ashir hasameach bechelko. In the eyes of Chazal, a, a wealthy person, a rich person, is a person who is content and happy with what he has, not occupying in what he does not have. When I was like, I was thinking about yesterday, I was driving my kid, you know, I picked him up. So I was thinking about it, I said, it's my goodness, you know, was I, why, why I was thinking about it. I heard a song of Fleetwood Mac. It's really, I don't like that song altogether. But what was so special about this song? It was the first color broadcasting in the history of the state of Israel. When I grew up, TVs were black and white. TV was black and white. And I'll tell you that, I never had a problem with TV being black and white. I was just happy to have a TV. I remember when my parents got a TV in 1969. Nobody had TV. A few, very few people had TVs. So, so uh, you know, people used to come over to our house to watch TV, to watch the news. It was amazing. So I was happy. I was happy to have a TV. I used to watch Walt Disney. And it never bothered me that it's black and white. Watch soccer games. It was all black and white. No problem whatsoever. No problem whatsoever. However, when I saw the first game, the first show, or the first broadcast in color, and I saw the color, the first broadcast in color, that was an announcement. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to broadcast, we switch our thing to color. And I was like, wow! I was sitting there, remember, I was like, Wow, that's amazing. it's amazing. Can't wait. I don't remember this, the first broadcast. For whatever reason, they picked up that thing. And I said, that's it? <laughs> this is it? This is all it has to do with everything? I couldn't believe it. And guess from now on, from that point on, from that point on, what happened? Do you know what happened? Black and white TV was not good anymore. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I was perfectly fine with black and white. 
Do you know anybody today watching black and white? You won't even think about it. Today is not good anymore. Now you have to have HD. You have to have this. You have to have that. You know, CRISPR. I mean, there is so much that my eye can see clear. With like 5 billion pixels. I don't know, whatever. God, I don't have really time. So at a certain point, they just make them bigger and bigger. And now thinner and thinner. But instead of watching TV, I'll show you the best pixels in the world. Go outside and look. Go outside and look. So that's a big problem. Now, another thing that we have, <clears throat> which is called the paradox of excess information. The paradox of excess uh, information, which is in a way is a similar feeling of regret or missing uh, things that we do today, which we experience every single day by having technology and, and, and communication, internet, etc., and so on and so forth. But for that, we're gonna do it in some other time. So until then, cliffhanging until a later date, we're gonna show you the problems of internet and how the internet actually reduces your, your feeling of contentment from your life. So until then, choose right, choose less, and have a fun day. <laughs>